Okay, while they're setting that up, um, I want to go ahead and welcome our next speaker. So, Brian Philip Murphy is Chief Architect at ReliaQuest, currently driving technical vision on the Gray Matter platform. As an honors graduate from the University of Limerick in Ireland, he relocated to Silicon Valley in California to start his career. And highlights from this 20-year career include inventing the first search engine for machine data as the first employee at Splunk, creating the watcher alerting component of Elasticsearch for Elastic, and driving one of the very early cloud security components at Logly, which was acquired by SolarWinds. When he's not working, he's figuring out how to turn on his presentation. <laughs> and also, <laughs> relaxing in St. Petersburg, Florida with his wife, four-year-old daughter, and two unexpectedly aggressive terrier pups. Um, I'll just keep talking about him while he... <laughs> <laughs> He is talking about future engineering. Thank you for, <laughs> for filling me out there. <laughs> All right. All right. So finally, we got it running. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Um, like Lauren said, uh, I'm Irish. Another I'm originally American. I uh, worked at Splunk, Elasticsearch, and Logly. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about what we, what we do, so you can kind of understand the problem space that I live in. Um, so we partnered with Splunk and other Fortune 1000. Uh, managing their security model. And what that means is we typically are deeply involved in their SIM and EDR platforms. Um, we build out content for them. Um, we run hunt campaigns. We do investigates, uh, investigations through them. Um, we build out health content. So typically, the world I live in is in that log data level. Um, I've been involved in SIMs in, uh, for a long time. Um, at Splunk, Elasticsearch, and Logly. Um, kind of building that kind of event-based data. Um, so that's kind of what's really important to me. So it's slightly different from a lot of the malware we've heard about the um, last couple of days. Um, so typically, uh, a lot of people, when in my world, they say machine learning system is just you pour the data in and you get the answers out, especially because it looks fairly structured, or at least it can be structured. Um, so we have a lot of problems coming up with those features. And I'll skip this because I think everyone understands. But um, one of the things we need to do is we need to be able to create encoders that represent the individual, individual elements of the set while maintaining their relationships. Um, a lot of the data and the features we look at are textual, uh, and they're not easily um, maintained in, tradition, in a lot of the more common encoding methods. Uh, we're looking at URIs, domains, log messages. Um, typically, we want to classify and detect outlier malicious activity. Also, usernames are very important here. Um, and they're not always encoded the same way. For example, um, for me, um, when I look at logs in ReliQuest, um, my username is P. Murphy. Um, there's the other Brian Murphy, he's the CEO, so I didn't get B. Murphy. Um, so I have P. Murphy at ReliQuest.com, P. Murphy, and sometimes ReliQuest slash P. Murphy. And all of these are my username within ReliQuest. Um, and within different systems, it's represented differently. And it becomes very much a domain problem to try and figure out what, to try and group those together. Uh, also, geolocations. Um, typically, similar attacks will come from the same geo regions. Uh, not necessarily the same countries. Uh, we also see vendor regionality, uh, especially with smaller vendors that are very region locked. Um, so when an exploit's released for that vendor, we may see that uh, go across different regions. Uh, and also, we look, we're looking at, say, auth authentication hunts. So we're looking for outliers in authentication behavior. Um, and that is obviously, geo is very important there. But also, we have executives who travel, say, in Europe, in the Benelux countries. So one hot encountering name does, typically doesn't work. Uh, and this is one of our issues, right? It's like most of our, the algorithms we use require columnar numeric values, uh, like typically bytes, or you're looking at number of headers. Um, you're looking at something that's easy to one hot encode or to um, encode. A lot of times we can't, because we're dealing with terabytes and petabytes of, of streaming data, we can't hold all this in RAM. We can't do individual field level comparison. We can't hold all the values of the field in RAM. We don't even know what values may come up. Um, so we can't hold even the values of all the fields in RAM, and summarization becomes very difficult. Um, some of the things commonly used are feature hashing, so just taking the hash of the feature and, and using that as the column name, as in the column values. One hot 
um, basically expanding the values across the different columns and ordering or label encoding. Um, they don't work for us great. Uh, locale, you lose all your locality of information. So if I one hash, if I feature hash uh, P Murphy or P Murphy rely request or P Murphy at rely request, um, I get different hashes. Um, one hot just a feature explosion. Um, and we don't see those new values, so if a new employee comes in, we lose that. And a lot of times, that's our, we're trying to build models that we can use for across different customers um, and across different um, evolutions as they evolve. Um, and the label encoding, while well, it's great for things like, um, like we were looking at earlier, like how relevant something is or how dangerous something is, in our world, it's typically, we don't have that. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about, I know probably most people are used to them, is uh, min, min, min hash using shingles and n-grams, and I also have a novel geo-hashing algorithm. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about uh, n-grams. So we're, for those who are not familiar with doing text processing, typically a contiguous sequence of characters from the events. So for example, for CAMLESS, we'll n-gram encode it, or three-gram encode it into CAM, AML, ML, MI, MLI, and LIS. And shingles are basically to tokens what n-grams are to characters. So one of the things we do, um, and it's very important, um, min hashing, and this is used, being used a lot to detect duplicates, um, but we use it to detect commonalities. Uh, it's a little bit different. So if you look at the Jacquard similarity, uh, it's really accurate, but you need to compare everything to every, 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 every data point to every other data point in the set. It's not possible. Um, so we'll approximate that by creating k hash functions and hashing them, uh, each n-gram or shingle, and then finding the min value for each hash. Um, Events that share those hash min hashes are similar. The or typically the order of that error is um, one over root k, where k is the number of hashes you've chosen. Um, and this sounds bad because that sounds like, hey, I need to create a hundred hashes to have a 10% chance, only getting a 10% chance of an error. But it's actually not too bad. We don't like having that error is fine. We're not trying to look for that exact match. We're trying to look for things that are close. So typically we can create use k hashes where k is about one over the, or 10% of the average length of the token we're trying to encode. Um, so for URIs, um, which we typically see are about 80 characters, um, we, you can use eight hashes to get a very reasonable response. Um, a lot of what we're doing is not to I positively identify something. We're trying to give our analysts a leg up. Um, we have analysts, uh, our analysts are a big cost center for us. We have a SOC here in Vegas, a SOC in Tampa, a SOC in Dublin, Ireland. Um, and all we're trying to do is give our analysts a hint of where to look next, not trying to solve the world. It's not something that we're trying to, it's not, it's not going, we're not going to stop a binary running on a system. We're going to like say, hey, this looks interesting, go look at this first. And the great thing about being able to do this is that it encodes all our values into a known number of columns. And new values are handled if they're similar to fitted values and will be similar encoded. And obviously it's a linear time. Um, event by event processing. So as we scale up the number of events, the time scales linearly. So this worked very well for us um, and it was giving us very good results for those kind of categorical values, um, such as URIs, domain names, usernames, log messages themselves um, that are generated from print strings. They're typically very well encoded by the shingle way. But the trick is we got to geo and geo is hard. Um, for us in particular. Um, so we use geohashing. Um, for anybody who's done any kind of GS, GIS before, you're probably familiar in that we partition the globe into a categorical or a hierarchical n by n grid using a z curve. And actually, the curve doesn't really matter whether it's a Hibbert curve or a z curve on how you partition the geospace. What matters is being able to assign one of these two letter variables or n letter variables um, to a grid space. Um, so what we can do then is we can calculate a bivariate, which is a 3D normal distribution, with the loca location, the peak of, distri of distri distribution, um, and we'll basically choose sigma so that one basically is at that peak. So sigma ends up being about 0.38. Um, so based on the distance from the grid peak, we can assign values across the grid. Um, this results in n by n columns representing a decaying weight from the detected action. So this gives us typically about 1024 columns, or 1024 grids, grid entries, and 1024 hash columns, um, and lets us do that locality of information across the geo grid. Um, it also allows encoding all of the possible geo locations in a known number of columns. Um, <coughs> new locations are obviously allowed for, and it remains, retains those relationships. It's much better for us to do this than, say, one-hot encoding the 
country name or using the Euclidean, and it behaves a lot better than, I'll show you, than encoding the, um, that long as Euclidean's. Uh, one of the great real advantages is that we can pre-compute uh, all the lookups and the values to accelerate this encoding. Um, since that if we know something, if we know something happens in EH, for example, we already know all the distribution away from that EH. So we can pre-compute these, and it becomes very, very fast to generate the encodings. So one of the things I want to do is a demo. Um, so I've built a toolkit in Splunk to do a lot of encodings, um, such as we just have some entropy, we have the hashing, and we have geohashing. Unfortunately, um, couldn't get the AV to work. So, but I do have some screenshots that kind of walk through it. Oh, this does not go well when I convert it to PDF, unfortunately. Um, Oh, well. Um, so you can kind of see here that this is um, some of the min hashing. Um, you can kind of see here this is the clustering of those min hashed uh, groupings. It behaves fairly well. Um, okay, this one might be interesting. So this is distancing. I think it's, it's hard to see. Unfortunately, this was um, done kind of last minute to encode the, to bring this up into this. But uh, I'll release a better version of the slides with, the, with everything included better. But this is... Um, it's so using Euclidean distance or Euclidean variables um, to kind of do the geohashing encoding. And you can see here it's um, using k-means to do some grouping. Um, and you can see that basically the countries, um, Canada, Japan, the United States, um, were grouped together based on the events we saw, which is obviously from our perspective not great because we want to know when people transition from, to different countries and we want to be able to group those together. Um, this is basically the ge using the geohashing approach. You can see where we have um, one <coughs> and one here. These are actually neighboring cells. And when we do that, uh, when we do the k-means to group them together, we say, hey, group me, give me about 20, give me 20, uh, 20 clusters. Uh, you can see we do pretty well. So we actually pull all that together. You can see we have, if you're not sure, you can see here, let's just say New York um, kind of groups all those kind of closer um, cities together that are coming out. And this is just based off the lat longs um, and based off that single pass. We're not bringing all this together to do any kind of uh, close, any kind of um, pairwise distancing or anything like that. It's just on a single pass, um, encoding the locations into the geohash and then using k-means to cluster them afterwards. Um, and it's very performant. Um, you see here to do about, a, it was 100,000. It took about 25 seconds to do the geohashes on my laptop. Um, this is available or will be available um, on my GitHub. I'm just waiting for a sign up from legal from our team and also as a Splunk base, um, uh, uh, basically an app for Splunk on Splunk base. Um, so, unfortunately, sorry about the demo, guys. Um, I'm sorry about those screenshots. I thought the PDF would render better, but uh, I guess it didn't. Uh, I guess we have another one. All right, thank you, Brian. We'll open it up for questions. I was curious, so you use like a locality-based hashing uh, to, and then doing clustering on top of that, and you said you use k-means. So I was curious, uh, with the k-means, how, how did you get your k? Was it, is it something like domain expertise, or is it more just? So I, I was just to kind of to demonstrate that, that, that it works, right, to okay. do the locality-based hashing. Um, it shows 20 based on the data set that we had. Um, typically, um, we'll depend on the kind of the domain that we're looking at, but 20 tends to be reasonable um, for the data set we look at. Sometimes we may go up to 30. It depends on the um, customer base and basically looking at where their um, expected um, different locations are. Okay. So typically our customers are in the kind of Fortune 1000 area, so typically 30 locations is typical. Um, I was going to ask you if you could elaborate any on what are some of the model, the prediction models, or the questions that you've tried to answer so um, using the, these I'll, engineers. A lot of what we try to answer is what's anomalous or what, what looks different from the baseline. Um, and a lot of that's one of the reasons that we have to encode them, uh, encode the geo like this, because we want to know what, what activity has, has drifted, what's the difference in binning between like last week versus this week. Do we see a... Uh, difference in the executive movement? Do we see a login from uh, unexpected places um, beyond just simply one hot encoding the data or trying to do a pairwise distance analysis? Thanks. 
questions? Anyone? All right, well, we can wrap it up then. Thank you, Brian.